Now, the first step to understanding inertia operation is understanding that guns recoil. This is not a particularly novel thing, but in the case of a shotgun, that's quite obvious, right? You shoot the gun, and the gun's going to move backwards and then push you backwards a little bit with it. Whenever a shotgun like the Heilgren is fired, immediately the gun is going to start recoiling. The barrel, receiver, stock, and bolt itself are going to recoil backwards, but the bolt carrier is going to stay right where it was. It's not going to be for a very long period of time, but the rest of the gun is going to recoil while the bolt carrier group stays right where it is. Between the bolt carrier and the bolt itself, there's a very, very heavy spring. After the gun fires, the recoil of the rest of the gun is going to push that spring against the bolt carrier. It's that objects at rest tend to stay at rest. Well, the bolt group is going to stay at rest because the recoil from the fired round hasn't pushed on it yet. In order for the bolt carrier to get pushed on, that big drive spring is going to have to get compressed first. As that spring gets compressed, compressed by the rest of the gun running backwards, now the bolt carrier has that spring pushing on it. Your body is going to stop the recoil of the rest of the gun. Normally whenever a gun recoils, we're used to seeing the gun move backwards, and then the person's body is going to stop the gun from moving backwards. It's at this point that that compressed spring between the rest of the gun and the bolt group is going to be able to uncompress, only because the rest of the gun is quite heavy and the bolt carrier is quite light, that spring is going to push the bolt carrier backwards a lot harder than it's going to push the rest of the gun forwards. And it's at this moment that the gun will cycle. The bolt will be driven to the back by its drive spring, which was compressed by the recoil from the fired round. As it moves backwards, it will compress a secondary spring, which is really the regular recoil or action spring, that will then push the bolt back forwards to chamber the next round. Now, as a quick demonstration, we can push forward on the bolt carrier group just to compress that drive spring a tiny bit. Of course, whenever the round is fired, it'll be compressed quite a bit further than this. But we can see there that little bit of movement springs backwards because there's a spring inside the gun that we're compressing. A lot of people will confuse inertia operation with being a form of blowback operation, right? Where the fired round is just pushing the bolt backwards. This is not true. Uh, inertia operated systems are all locked breech, right? The bolt is locked solidly into the receiver or the barrel, right? And this makes it plainly not a form of blowback action and it's not a form of delayed blowback either because the breech is going to stay locked until an external member acts on the bolt to unlock it. In the case of an inertia-operated shotgun like we have here, that's the bolt carrier being pushed backwards by the drive spring will unlock the bolt, pick it up, and then pull it backwards. Inertia operation is not blowback. It's not a form of delayed blowback. It is a true lock breach action. And this holds true for the other inertia-operated systems, including the Benelli 121, the Browning A500, and clones and derivatives thereof. In each of these cases, they are a true locked breech action, where it has a bolt carrier, or a floating mass, and then a drive or accumulator spring. And after the gun is fired, the locked parts of the action, you know, those being the bolt and its locking piece, the receiver, the furniture, and the barrel, will all move backwards under recoil, but that floating piece will not move. And between that floating piece and the recoiling parts of the gun, you will have that drive or accumulator spring that gets compressed until your body stops the recoil of the gun, at which point that spring is free to decompress, which will then begin to cycle the action. And the three parts that we'll find in common across these different inertia operated systems is your floating mass. If that's a bolt carrier style system or a different bolt carrier style system or the Hilgren's bolt carrier style system, you will have this floating mass. Additionally, you have an accumulator spring. This will sit between the floating mass, in the case of the Benelli down in there, and its locking pieces. In the case of the Benelli, it's got this falling block system, but the spring is going to sit between the bolt lockup system and this floating mass, such that whenever the gun fires, this will be locked into the receiver. So you have these pieces move backwards into that mass compressing the spring as it does so. Once that spring is able to decompress, your gun is able to cycle. This brings us to a discussion of the advantages and disadvantages of an inertia system. Like recoil operated shotguns, the Auto 5 or short recoil systems like the AR-17, inertia operated systems don't have any gas takeoff or any gas venting off the barrel to get the action parts dirty. So they have an advantage over gas operated shotguns in that regard. However, a major downside of the inertia operated system compared to most recoil operated systems is that this spring doesn't really do any buffering of the the force of recoil. The gun is going to hit your shoulder like a locked breech gun, like a brake action or a pump action, and it will recoil into your shoulder and you'll feel all of that before the gun begins to cycle. Because of course the gun has to begin its recoil stroke, compress the spring, your body stops the recoil before the bolt can then reciprocate and do the feeding and cycling. Because of this, inertia operated shotguns generally aren't as smooth on recoil as some gas operated or especially recoil operated shotguns can be. However, that doesn't necessarily have to be looked at as a downside. In a properly designed inertia operated system, the bolt cycles lightning quick 
because of how fast recoil sets in and gets arrested by your body, and how quickly a spring this heavy will uncompress and rocket the bolt backwards. However, the most commonly pointed out downside of inertia operated systems is that fact that they have to recoil. If the gun is held rigidly against an object, it won't be able to cycle because it needs the locked parts of the gun to be able to recoil to compress the spring. If the gun is held so rigidly that nothing really moves and the spring doesn't get compressed, the gun can't cycle. An additional complicating factor is that inertia operated systems by way of really only having the one drive spring are really only set up to work correctly with one particular load weight of shotgun shell. While a particular spring will be capable of having a sort of an upper band and a lower band of shells it will work with, you won't necessarily get the same variety of load handling that you can get from certain recoil operated shotguns or even certain gas operated shotguns, where gas operated shotguns just need a certain pressure at the gas port to want to cycle. Inertia operated shotguns need a certain physical movement of the gun induced by firing. In a drive spring that is too light will get beat up with too heavy of loads, and in a drive spring that's too heavy won't cycle with too light of loads, so it sort of becomes a balancing act. The Browning A500 design tried to get around some of these inertia operated downsides by integrating a floating barrel into the inertia operated system. As such, it's no longer important that the gun recoils, but that the barrel recoils, and because you don't hold on to the barrel, the barrel's pretty much guaranteed to recoil. However, the A500 had some other flaws in its design and execution that made it not such a great design, and most shooters of inertia-operated shotguns just deal with the downsides and take the upsides. Ultimately, inertia operation is very interesting because in terms of mechanisms, it's actually very, very simple. It's just a spring that pushes the bolt back. But in terms of understanding how all that happens, it requires understanding quite a few things about the nature of firearms and the way their actions work themselves. Hopefully this video did a decent job of making it a little bit easier for some of you to understand how inertia-operated shotguns work. Here on the channel, we'll be taking deep dives into each of these shotguns to really see what makes them tick, how they work on the inside, and how their inertia systems actually work and then differ from each other. If that sounds like something you'd be interested to, please subscribe and follow along. Not only will we be looking at inertia operated shotguns, but all sorts of other different shotgun actions as well as stuff that's not shotguns, uh, printed stuff and gun history and those sorts of things. If you'd like to support me in making these sorts of videos, maybe if this video helps you out, you could go into the description or my bio and find a link to my Patreon. You can give me money dollars there, and more money dollars means more videos explaining more things. With all that said, I hope you guys have a nice day, and I'll catch you next time.